stories related to Christmas, and especially now, like with the explosion of Christmas movies, we've seen the movie Elf three times yesterday, and um, there are a lot of them out there. So I thought we might start today with just a little jog your memory, a little trivia. I'm going to use one word from a well-known Christmas movie, and then I want you to respond together which movie it is and see who can get these the fastest, okay? All right, first word is who will? How the Grinch Stole Christmas. That's good. Got that one right. Okay. Next word is Bedford Falls. It's a wonderful life. Let's see. There it is. Okay. The next word is Vermont. Ooh. Ooh. That one's hard. Okay. Let's see. White Christmas. Who in the room has not seen White Christmas ever? Yeah, me too. Okay. It's awful, isn't it? Go home and repent. Next word, flagpole. Christmas story. Yes, let's see. Yep. And they're like doing a live remake of that, right? There's a little plug for that. Okay. Next word, abominable or hard to say that, bumble. Oh, I hear different. Let's see. Let's see. What is it? Rudolph. Yeah, from Yukon Cornelius. Okay, Macy's. Miracle on. Let's see it. Yep, you got that one right. That's the original. Okay, Silk Hat. Frosty the Snowman. Let's see. This one might be a little harder. Patrick Stewart, Daffy Duck, Jim Carrey, Mickey Mouse, George, C. Scott, and Kermit the Frog. Yeah, the Muppets, one of those, yes. And finally, Cut Feet. That's right, Die Hard. So uh, here in church, you heard it. Settles the argument for all time in the presence of God that Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. All those stories, some strange, some funny, some almost not appropriate or totally not appropriate, uh, basically all sort of tell a cohesive story We go to the movies and expect an ending, a happy ending. There's this sort of, you know, wherever we come into the stories, they do things to help us get into it. And then, you know, the sort of issues that play, and then they all resolve at the end. If you start the Christmas story in Luke 1, you kind of don't get that. It's almost like you're plopped right down in the middle of some story. And there, there are things that have been going on and characters that are at play and issues that are, are going that you just kind of aren't aware of. And it's, um, it's a little uh, unnerving in a way. There are characters and situations that y- you need to, to know kind of the backstory on and kind of wonder what, what they're saying and, and, what, and what they're thinking. And yet, as you read Luke 1 and Luke 2, what you hear again and again and again is um, from the message of the shepherd, angels to the shepherds that this is something to get excited about. This is, uh, fear not, something not to be afraid of. Fear not, I bring you good news, the angel said, of great joy that will be for all people. And uh, here in the, sort of plopped in the middle of the story, you, get, you see people getting very excited and we're not sure yet why. Uh, in the scripture that Katie read to us, you have this little interlude with Elizabeth and Zechariah and an angel coming to them and saying that they're going to give birth to their own son and then Mary hears the same message and then when the two pregnant mamas get together I mean it sort of gets it's 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 exciting their their anticipation starts to grow and the the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy and Elizabeth and Zachariah represent kind of bringing in the full story of the Old Testament to this moment when Jesus was announced they represent all kinds of Old Testament expectations. They represent people like Abraham and Sarah who also were barren and old and then are are promised a child. Uh, They represent all the expectations of the prophets and their son John the Baptist who is leaping for joy even before he comes out of the womb is going to be a prophet. And they represent this Old Testament pattern of God's relentless pursuit of people uh, of, of, of affirming his covenant to his people in a way that will ultimately cross all boundaries. 
So they're excited. And they start to uh, get, get uh, to the point where they're jumping for joy. And, and then Mary breaks into song. If you keep reading, uh, it's this, this weird song of how God is going to do something totally unexpected and flip everything upside down. Then there's the interlude with the angels. And I, I often wonder like what that scenario is about. And kind of have this, like, it's not very biblical, but if you read between the lines, this, this scenario that I imagine where the angels who have the inside track on what God is doing and have kind of seen the fuller story are the first to really get excited about what is happening with Jesus coming because they know what it means. They, they, uh, they know the ache in God's heart to love people and they've seen it play out again and again and again from God's perspective, the disappointment and hurt and yet unquenchable desire simply to, to love people. And now they see God acting definitively to, to reveal that. And they're excited. Imagine the angels going to God and saying, we got to tell somebody. I mean, Gabriel, he got to tell uh, Zachariah. He got to tell Mary. Who do we get to tell? And all the, you know, those angels are so excited. Remember the Looney Tune cartoon with the big dog and the little dog? Does anybody remember that? Like big dog Spike and then the little dog's like bouncing over him back and forth. Boing, 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 boing. That's the scenario I imagine the angels are just bouncing around like crazy. Uh, trying, trying to figure out who they get to tell the message. And God says, okay, um, here's what we'll do. You go blow the hair back on some of those shepherds over there and see how that goes. Because they're so excited. And Jesus would later say, there's more rejoicing in heaven over what? One sinner who repents than over the 99 who don't need to. And the angels, he's sort of cluing us into the fact that the angels are prone to get kind of riled up about this stuff. Because they know what it means. They have a perspective on it. And they, too, see that God is going to turn things upside down. Something new is beginning. And that newness is the source uh, of great joy. Um, as we think about where we fit into the story, and as, the, as we recognize that God comes into the middle of our story, and that it's not all complete yet, and... Uh, there's some unresolved parts, and God sort of meets each of us where we are. I want to uh, sort of kind of help us kind of uh, get ready for the week ahead. We have about a week before Christmas. Uh, we have Christmas Eve, uh, as Martha said, a week from today, actually. And um, you heard the service times, and um, we're going to come. And one of my favorite parts of Christmas is uh, when we get together and we all light a candle that represents the light of the world coming into the world. And our small step of faith, our, our attempt, our best attempts to believe, and sometimes we succeed and sometimes we have doubts, uh, the, that very message from the angels, that we don't have to be afraid, that God is doing something that is absolutely good news that causes great joy for literally everybody. Uh, we have a week to get ready for that, and you've probably got a lot of things between now and then. So this is our chance to remember that this great joy part is an important part, and it is, it is for us. That God is, in fact, turning our world upside down and kind of shaking it and, um, and, and letting things fall where they may, and sometimes that's scary and painful. But in the midst of all that, whether personally or uh, in the big big picture this is a story of, of good news of great joy for all people and that means you and me that idea that God is turning things upside down got me th connecting two things that maybe don't need to be connected or maybe uh, you haven't noticed but I I've seen where like in 2017 all of a sudden people have discovered the upside down Christmas tree have you seen that has anybody seen one of those I've got a few pictures in case you haven't you know like this is a real thing right you see that picture and you're like really uh, yeah, this is, this is a real thing. People are putting upside down Christmas trees in their houses and then uh, in some like pretty poshy kind of public places and grand hotels and shopping centers. This has become a thing in 2017 and you can actually go to the store to Target or to Walmart and buy one of these things. You don't sound too excited. And so that got me thinking, what is the deal with the upside down Christmas tree? Have you thought about this? How many of you did not know this was a thing at all, right? Okay, it's a thing. 
So, uh, so, so what's the deal with the upside down Christmas tree? Well, I've sort of done a little research and there's some theories out there. One of them is that people need more room in their houses and the Clark Griswold Christmas tree that flops over and you know, have no room in your house gets in the way of you know, other things that you wanna do. So this is a nice way to create space. A similar theory is that it also creates more room under the tree for presents. I don't know if that's true or not either, but maybe that's the case. Uh, one theory is that it kind of goes back to the original Christmas, tr Christmas tree, which was actually probably, uh, maybe, hung upside down from a rafter because we didn't have Christmas tree stands back in the 12th century. We didn't have, you know, where you could go and uh, pre-drill a tree, a live tree, or buy an artificial one. And so um, St. Boniface, who, uh, who saw a, a, a Christmas, uh, an evergreen tree growing and used that as a symbol of Christmas, may have just chopped that thing down and hung it upside down in his house. I don't buy any of those, but I do have one other, one other thought, which is kind of interesting, it get, and it has to do with St. Boniface, who, who might have hung his tree upside down, and then we do know used it as a symbol of the Trinity, the three parts of God's nature, God the Father who created all that is out of his motivation to love, and then the, all the way to the other end, uh, the spirit of God, which will be turned loose to all people so that God might lead and guide them in his love and his ways. The very thing we prayed over Gabby this morning in baptism. And then in the middle of that, God, the, the son, the savior who's come into the world. And the only reason I might think this upside down Christmas tree thing might have a little bit of validity and I don't think any of you are going to go turn yours upside down, uh, is that it helps us and it helps St. Boniface understand the true nature of the story of Christmas. Because it kind of only works when the tree is upside down. If God the Father is on the upper left and the Spirit is on the upper right, down at the bottom is Jesus. And it teaches us about how this thing is gonna go. The Christmas story is just the opposite of what we tend to think. The joy that we talk about is an unexpected joy. God is not up there, God is down here. We get close to God, not by climbing this imaginary ladder of goodness that points us to the pinnacle at the top. We in instead find God at work coming to us. God is not up there, God is down here, God is not far away, God is in the middle of your story and mine. And that's the unexpected joy of Christmas, that not that we find God, but that God is coming to find us. And that is a source of joy that we find getting uh, people all worked up in the Christmas story, from barren parents to virgin mothers, to leaping from leaping fetuses to angel choruses. They heard the story as part of a bigger story. And I would invite us to do the same. The story, not of us going to God, but of God coming to us. And in a week, we're about to come to the main event. And I want us to think of ways that we can be ready to make this joy our joy. So let me give you three thoughts of how to do that. The first would be to look for joy in unexpected places. It's right there in the story. The weird part of the Christmas message and the weird part of Christianity is that when we expect to find joy, we don't. The things that we think will make us happy don't, in fact, make us happy. And in the places where we don't expect to find happiness and joy, in the very places where we expect to, to, to not find it, that's where, that's where we do. The Christmas story reminds us that we expect to find God at work in palaces and power and privilege, but we don't find that there. The Christmas story reminds us that God is at work in mangers, and in the middle of our messes, and in the middle of our stories. So the joy that we talk about, that we sing about, that we decorate for, whether your tree's upside down or not, the, the, the joy that we are so prone to talk about at Christmas is a particular kind of joy. It's an unexpected joy. It's a joy not of getting all worked up about something and looking positive at life, but recognizing that God has come into the middle of the mess to do something. It's in the middle of it kind of joy. It's the joy of those who learn to expect God to do something, no matter what. It's the joy of people who don't have all their story figured out yet, but know that God is with them. And it's sometimes the tear-stained joy 
of those who have walked in darkness, but who also have seen a great light, just as John will later say. Look for joy in unexpected places. I saw that this week, actually. I was um, driving back and forth from work. I have, I have people that I know along the way. It just so happens that two of the people that have, have um, sort of, in, in a public way, lost someone, tragically, a child th this year, two of those are my neighbors, and I go past their houses every day to and from work. And I've tried to make it my sort of personal mission in, in their grief is to pray for them when I drive past their houses every day. And some days I don't get that, but I try to pray on, on my way into work and my way home to pray for them and to um, grieve with them in that way and to just uh, tr try to do whatever, you know, you know how it is, you want to do something. I was driving back home this week and I noticed the Christmas decorations going up amongst our neighbors and I literally almost stopped in the middle of the road as I came back past one of our neighbors on the way home uh, who had lost someone tragically this, this year. There among the Christmas decorations by the front door are those three letters. Right by the front door. J-O-Y. It reminded me that joy comes in unexpected places and that's something that we can claim in faith. That it's, it's the kind of joy that was there in the original Christmas story as God is yet again acting for people who have, who have longed for something more. In the midst of all those unmet expectations and all those questions, Jesus. It was unexpected. And as we know, the shepherds go and they hear this message and they're, they're, they're told, go and look for this baby in a manger. This is, this is people being told, Go look for this in, in an unexpected way. And so we do as well. Second thing I think about the kind of joy that we're talking about at Christmas is to extend grace beyond our normal limits. This too is in the Christmas story. That we find joy in joining God, in crossing the sort of normal boundaries of uh, being stretched and going to people out of love. This Christmas, I would invite you to do the same. To, to stretch yourself. To be ready to, be, to give and to love beyond the normal limits, whatever that means. It might apply to your family when they come to your house and they stay for a while, <laughs> hypothetically. It might apply to just the way you are aware of opportunities to be part of this revolution that's unfolding. We find joy, Christians find joy, the Christmas story teaches us to find joy in joining God, in showing grace beyond what is expected, in forgiving when it's not deserved, in showing love and building relationship and investing in people when it's hard. The Christmas story could be summed up in this little phrase, love crosses all boundaries. And that is something to get worked up about in our world as much as ever before. I would invite you to do that, to find some way to do something awkward and uncomfortable this year, something that stretches you to express love and grace. Finally, uh, I think we find joy when we simply trust that this story is about me, that this story is about, is about you, to know it, to presume on it, to not forget it, to um, recognize that the very thing we were meant to know is the, maybe the first thing that gets lost in the whole celebration. The love of God that will not let us go, the, the, the love of God that's crossed all boundaries for you, for me. That song we sang earlier, O Holy Night, has that line that says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining. And into the middle of the story, uh, we, we hear the next line, Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. That's kind of the point, isn't it? That God has crossed all boundaries so that you would know what, that you are loved. It affirms that each one of us is of sacred worth to God. That God still pursues his dream of having us home, so much so that he gave his son for us. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, at our Greenwood campus, they had a hanging of the green service. And we did this at the, in the sanctuary here at Melrose. 
But at Greenwood, they have, they've kind of had a, a tradition of this, and adults and children gather, and they decorate the Greenwood campus, and it's uh, kind of a fun event. And they asked Pastor Wayne to say a little something to the kids. We don't do children's moments in our, in, in, on our Sunday morning services, but this gives us a little time to spread out. And so they asked him to say something to the kids. So he sat them down and he said, here's what I want you to do. There's going to be a lot of things that you see in the next few weeks that remind you of the Christmas story. You're going to see Christmas trees. You're going to see wreaths and you're going to see lights and maybe even Santa's. As sort of an aside, I saw Santa Claus as part of our security team this morning at church, and I'm not lying. Look for it. He's here. It's just a weird thing. But you're going to see all kinds of signs uh, of Christmas, and here's what I want you to do. This is what Pastor Wayne said to these kids. He said, I want you to remember this simple phrase. Those, those uh, decorations rem are here to remind you that Jesus loves you, and he always will. And then he went to each child and said that message. He put his hand on each child's head and said, Jesus loves you, and he always will. Jesus loves you, and he always will. Jesus loves you, and he always will. And I don't know how many there were, 10, 10 or 12 of them there kind of gathered around. And the last little guy is Drew Davidson. His mom, Megan, is uh, on our staff. And Drew has never failed to rise to a challenge. So, uh, he, uh, so Pastor Wayne comes to him at the last one and says, Jesus loves you and he always will. And Drew said, what about the moms and dads? <laughs> and all the kids got very excited. And so Pastor Wayne had to go to each adult. Jesus loves you and he always will. Jesus loves you and he always will. Jesus loves you and he always will. And gosh, it kind of helps just to boil it down to that, doesn't it? This might be cheesy. But this is why I did the whole upside down Christmas tree thing. I want you just to put this up one more time and just sort of remember in the great scheme of things, sometimes it's helpful to have that little map that says you are here. Jesus loves you and he always will. And there's nothing that will stop that. This is the stuff that causes the heavens to explode in celebration. This is the stuff that makes babies leap for joy before they're even born. This is the stuff that makes shepherds go to tell a weird message to people who might just believe it. This is the stuff that gets churches motivated to be part of the revolution of God's grace in every time and every place. For what greater joy is there than this, that we know that we are loved unconditionally. just as you are, by the God who entered the story so that you might know it. Let's pray together. God, we confess that we don't always know what you most want us to, to realize. The simple message that we are loved and claimed and that all of history and all of eternity come to this pinnacle moment where your love is offered to each of us at great cost. We confess we've not always known what to do with it. Some of us have rejected that love and are still unsure if it, the story's true. And if that's someone this morning, God, I pray that you would uh, come alongside and gently as you do offer this great love yet again. There's someone in the room, God, and some of us who represent those who take this for granted or who have gone off and done what we want. And for that, we, um, for those, those of us in, in the room today, we... Um, Ask for forgiveness. And look to your eyes to see not anger or frustration, but only grace. And for all of us, God, who will celebrate Christmas likely one way or another, we pray that everything that we see around us, all these lights and, and wreaths and trees and joy signs, might be an overwhelming reminder to us 
of your great love for us in Christ, and that for us might be the source of our joy. And we pray it in Jesus' name.